Krishna Prasanna Bhagavata Shemate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Nami Namaste Saraswati Devi Kauravani Prasari Nirvishesha Sanyapati Paspityari Prasari Namaste Sarasate Deve Kauravani Vachari Ne Nirvishesha Sanyapati Paspityari Sanyapati Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhupada Randa Shriyadvaita Jaradhar Shiva Sadhu Gora Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhupada Randa Shriyadvaita Jaradhar Shiva Sadhu Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Rama Rama Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Hari 
So again, Hare Krishna everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we're going to complete our discussion in Chapter 27 of the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. Um, this book is written by Srila Prabhupada and is based on the authorized biography of Lord Chaitanya called the Chaitanya Charitamrita. And that biography was written by Srila Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami. So our chapter today is called Lord Chaitanya and Ramananda Rai, very, very important discussions. So we'll begin um, with praise to our spiritual masters so that we can um, best understand these discussions for the glorification of the Lord. Om Agyana Timirandasya Aginangina Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasma Shri Guru Venamaha Shri Chaitanya Malopishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadama Hyam Dadati Sopadantam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shumati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinamini Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pacharine Nirvishesh Shunivari Paschati Keshutarine Um so, um, I also pray for all your blessings to do justice to this class. Um, and we will also chant the invocation prayers, verse 18 of the first chapter of Chaitanya Charitamrita. Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Kaura Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Kaura Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda and the translation is glory to Sri Chaitanya and Nityananda. Glory to Advaita Chandra. Glory to all the devotees of Lord Chaitanya. Um, Sri Gora, who is Lord Chaitanya. So, like we've been doing for the last few weeks, um, we will um, glorify Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur uh, and close our series on his pastimes um, because it was the 150th appearance uh, anniversary of his a few weeks ago. So um, last week we had concluded um, with his um, his expansive preaching efforts, and um, and today we begin with something very important to him, that he sent devotees to preach in the West. It was his father, Shri Bhakti Skanda Saraswati Thakur's father, Shri Bhakti Noor Thakur, who had um, who had actually um, taken the words of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Seriously, for the first time, it seems in um, in the years after Lord Chaitanya's disappearance, that his holy names would be spread throughout the world. And some um, followers of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu thought that this was sort of a symbolic um, statement of the Lord, thinking that it, it was actually very difficult um, to do this. But Shri Bhakti Nathakur, he didn't just um, he didn't just believe in it; he actually envisioned it. We remember that he had a, he had a vision of this Adbhuta Mandir, um, this extraordinary temple rising up above the land of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's appearance. And there, devotees of, um, of all different nationalities and cultures and uh, social backgrounds races all joining together in order to glorify him. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he inherited this mission because Srila Bhakti Thakur realized that um, he had already past the prime of his life, and he wanted a successor who would take this um, this vision and make it a reality. So that was to the Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. So in that um, spirit, he sent three devotees to Europe. Um, and uh, and these devotees met many um, senior, uh, many dignitaries, many uh, spiritualists, and um, they did make a few um, a few devotees, um, but largely they were not as successful as Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur wanted. Mm -hmm. But still, he didn't give up in that effort. His disciples had given up. When they returned to India, they told him basically that they didn't feel like the people of the West would ever seriously take up these teachings. And, and one very famous example is of the Lord Zetland. And he was very favorable to the teachings of um, 
of the Vedas and he wanted to become a Brahmin. And he asked um, Shri Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's disciple, I think it was uh, Bhakti Saranda Goswami, what it would, um, it would actually, if it was possible for him to become a Brahmin and what it would entail. So um, when Saranga Goswami explained that it meant that one would have to give up meat eating, gambling, intoxication, and illicit sex, the 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 Marquis was very surprised and said, "Well, this is this is actually all that my life is composed of, so it's impossible to do." And with this in mind, Shri Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's disciples returned to him, but he, of course, still had this um, this this desire that was actually um, um, the 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 main desire in his um, we could say in his entire um, preaching mission. So. Um, he expressed this to Srila Prabhupada actually in a few weeks before, in a letter a few weeks before he left his um, his body and before he disappeared. And this, of course, became Srila Prabhupada's mission, and, and that's how it was fulfilled. So, in the interim, um, Srila Bhakti Sandhya Saraswati Thakur, he was still continuing with his very large scale preaching and publishing. Um, sorry, we're just going to put his image up for our meditation on him. So he continued with his large-scale preaching and publishing um, his exhibits and dioramas across India. He was opening temples and preaching centers, initiating devotees, including making a lot of sannyas um, disciples, and of course meeting important leaders and scholars. He also um, he also opened the samadhi for Shila Gokishwar Das Babaji Maharaj. And um, something very interesting was that at the yoga feed site, the site of Dr. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's um, appearance, he found um, while building the temple there a deity um, of Adokshaja. Adokshaja is the forearm form of the Lord, um, whom uh, Lord Chaitanya worshipped, the Lord Chaitanya's father worshipped. And this is a very important discovery because we know that that Yoga Pit site, the site of Lord Chaitanya's appearance, is very highly contested. There are many personalities who believe it is um, it's stated, it, sorry, it is to be found elsewhere. And Shri Bhakti Nautaku, he actually did a lot of research and, and there were many other um, important signs that he um, that led him to the conclusion that the site of Lord Chaitanya's birth is there at Yoga Pit at in Mayapur. And um, this deity was for the confirmation of that. So at the, at the time um, um, of this, um, of these pastimes in 1936, um, Shri Bhakti Saraswati Thakur actually developed a heart condition. But he was he was still vigorously preaching, and a, a doctor tried to restrain him. And his very um, awful words in that regard was, "Life is for the glorification of topics on Hari. If that is stopped, then what is the need to carry on life?" This is um, this is the motivation of a preacher. And then in Dhaka, he said, "Physical illness with Hari Bhajan is preferred to physical fitness." Sans Hari Bhajan, our span of life on earth is short. Our life will be crowned with success if the body wears out with constant discourses on Hari. So this basically he was presaging what was happening, what was going to happen because um, through the, the course of his preaching is that his health actually deteriorated. Um, and um, by the end of this year, he, he actually, 1936, he actually disappeared. So um, towards the end of, in about October of 1936, he went to Puri. Um, where he was actually quite ill, but he still observed many important festivals and lectured. Um, and he was he was actually giving hints to his disciples about how important it was that they all stayed together and continued um, in the preaching mission, um, because he also um, envisioned what would happen. He, he had said that there would be fire, that there would be um, there would be discord between his disciples, and um, and this actually was what. Um, fractured and stagnated his movement. So in Puri, he told his disciples, you all take to sincere Hari Bhajan. There are not many more days. After that, he went to Calcutta and, and he didn't return to Puri again. Puri is the place where he appeared. So in Calcutta, once more, um, he was giving um, what we understand now to be his final instructions to his disciples, how they should be dependent, like he was on the mercy of Guru. Everything that that he saw was the mercy of his guru, even up to his disciples. He saw his disciples as the mercy of his guru. 
sent to assist him in um, in the mission which he, he had dedicated his life to. He also instructed them a lot about being humble and about the dangers of pride and envy. And that is exactly what caused destruction in his mission. He was warning them about the fire. He was encouraging them just to focus on spreading on the Sankirtan movement, spreading the Sankirtan movement. So on the morning of the 31st of December, 1936, he asked his disciples to sing his favorite bhajans, which is um, Sri Rupa Manjari Pada, bhajan, um, Sri Rupa Manjari Pada, as well as the Sri Shikshashtaka prayers, Rajitanya Mahaprabhu's eight instructions um, for all, his, for all um, his followers. And in the afternoon, he checked in on a publication um, that he wished um, to be printed. And then he advised his disciples once more, please accept my blessings to, all, to you all, present and absent. Please bear in mind our sole duty and religion is to spread and propagate service to the Lord and his devotees. And the next morning, um, 1st of January, 1937, at five, half past five in the morning, he left this world while chanting the holy names of Krishna. So after his disappearance, his transcendental body um, was worshipped with oils, flowers, and um, scented oils, flowers, and sandalwood paste, and was brought before um, the deities in the hall, um, and decorated with flowers, garlands, and cloth. His form was worshipped, arti was performed, and then um, there was a huge Sankirtan party that carried his form to the railway station, um, because he was actually going to be transported um, by railway car to Krishnanagar. And so many thousands of people actually joined across this procession um, because he was so well loved and appreciated and respected. Um, and then after he reached Krishnanagar by Motika, he was travel. Um, he traveled to Saurabh Kanj, and then he was carried to Sri Ramayapur, um, to the place where his samadhi was to be located. Um, so first he was brought to Yoga Pit where Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared, then to the house of Shrivas Thakur, which is just next to Yoga Pit and then to Advaita Bhavan, where Advaita Acharya lived. And then he was brought to Rajapatan. So this place is where he um, chanted those uh, billion names of the Lord before he started his preaching in earnest, where he sat under a hut. So there, um, a very nice temple is now constructed. So um, alongside that is the Samadhi tomb of Kogishwar Das Babaji Maharaj's spiritual master. So his form was taken there, and then to, um, to the Mandir, where um, Kirtan was um, was held the whole night while his samadhi was being um, prepared. So at the end of the night, the samadhi um, at the end of the night, um, the mantras for samadhi were written on his body according to directions of Shri Gopal Bhatko Swami, which is um, given to us in Samskar Dipika. This is a this is a scripture that Gopal Bhatko Swami gave us. Oh, Gauri Vaishnavas to follow when these um, events occur. Um, marriages, deaths, like that. Um, then his body was brought to the Samadhi site. It was placed on a throne of white marble. His feet were anointed with a guru and sandal with paste and flowers, uh, and the flowers that were offered to his feet were collected. Usually these flowers are then put into a Samadhi called a Pushpa Samadhi. Um, flower garlands were offered to him and Tosi plants were, were planted on all sides of this um, Samadhi. And um, his favorite songs were sung. And then while chanting Ye Anila Premadana, the devotees circumambulated him and covered him um, with earth and marked um, the site with tilak, the, the sign of tilak and flower gardens. Um, thereafter, they performed the fire sacrifice. They offered hoga and arti. And um, there were readings from the disappearance of the Haridas Thakur, as well as some of Shila Bhakti Stanta Saraswati Thakur's famous favorite poems from his Anubhashya. And so the Acharya son, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, I called him the Acharya son, the sun, as in the sun in the sky, um, had, had set, at least from our earthly vision, for him to enter into the eternal pastimes of the Lord. So he was held in such great esteem that many um, intellectuals had memorial gatherings. And even those who would consider themselves his enemies, like the atheists, um, they actually... They, was, they were very sorrowful on his disappearance. One said, who will we argue with now? They appreciated his mission very much. Um, and there's a very interesting uh, quote from the Padma Purana that actually predicted the appearance of Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur. 
It says a very elevated, pure, and learned personality would appear in Purushottam Shetra, which is Jagannath Puri, to spread the glories of Lord Jagannath all over the world. His activities will be very unique. And this is, of course, um, we can see through all the descriptions of his pastimes in the last few weeks, quite true, because um, for that time in history, uh, every activity that he engaged in was unique, from the way that he dressed um, with uh, sewn cloth, tailored clothing, things that um, Renanzians at the time did not. The equipment that he used, which is which was all modern, which was all engaged in the service of Krishna, the initiations that he gave, at, um, even the initiation that he took, Sanyas initiation, when when um, um, becoming a Babaji was actually considered the standard, and giving initiation, giving Brahman initiation to those who were born in non-Brahman families, giving um, initiation to women, initiating sannyasis, and, and of course giving sannyas to those who were not born in Brahman families. Sending preachers overseas was also a very unique um, um, act for him. And so, so on, we can see that his um, his life was the fulfillment of, of this verse. So his extraordinary um, achievements were that at the time that he left this world, he opened 64 Gaudiya Mahat temples throughout India, right? including including that very beautiful temple at the site of Yogati, that was actually opened by the king of Tripura. Um, he had he was held in very high esteem by intellectuals and um, dignitaries in society. Um, he also established temples in Rangoon, in London, and in Germany. Um, he, of course, established many printing presses, and he printed thousands of books. He was actually uh, printing a daily newspaper called the Nadia Prakash. And we may think, um, like people question him, how it is that a newspaper can be printed every day about spiritual activities. But he answered that we have so many daily newspapers that are, that are full of nonsense, really. And yet these transcendental activities of the Lord are going on all the time, unlimited and, and of actual benefit. So there should definitely be a newspaper of that sort. So he called the printing press the Brihat Murdanga. It's the greater Murdanga. It can be heard all over versus just a few blocks if, if we're in San Kirtan. Um, so um, he actually, he also wrote um, quite extensively over 100, 108 essays and books. Um, as well as publishing so many articles in the, the daily, the weekly, and the monthly newsletters that he put out. He published the works of our Acharyas um, and Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur in particular. And um, in addition, he, um, he met with so many scholars, leaders, educators. He actually gave Krishna consciousness a very respectable um, face. Um, and, uh, and establish it as a science worthy of esteem. He had uh, so many interviews and debates with Acharyas. He was never defeated, um, the Lion Guru, establishing Lord Chaitanya Sachintya Bhairavya Tattva as supreme. Um, we mentioned his um, wonderful dioramas, exhibitions, theistic displays, uh, which were um, made up of toys, dolls, pictures, writings, um, mechanical devices, were actually moving the images, describing the pastimes of Lord Krishna and Lord Chaitanya. Um, he also established the Parikramas, right? the Navadvip Dham Parikrama and the Rajmandal Parikrama, which Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had actually, um, and Lord Chaitanya had actually begun, but were now brought into the modern day. Um, and he discovered many pilgrimage sites of the Lord's pastimes. And he established Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's lotus feet at many um, sites of his pastimes. On top of that, and perhaps most significantly, he ins empowered, instructed, and empowered Srila Prabhupada to actually spread um, the holy names throughout the world. So um, the platform that he laid so strongly and so um, shastrically is the platform that our whole movement is built on, and we owe him the greatest debt. Um, in Radha and Krishna's pastimes, he is Nayana Manjari. So uh, Nayana, Nayana Mani Manjari. So Nayana Mani Manjari and Kamala Manjari, who is Bhakti Thakur, they are both gopi assistants to Ananga Manjari. That's Radharani's younger sister. And they also serve Srila Rupa Manjari, um, who we remember appeared in Hoshitani Mahaprabhu's pastimes as Srila Rupa Goswami. 
So, all oh, glory to Shiva Bhakti Sanskrit Swati Thakur and he bless us all um, with his mercy so we can attain pure devotional service to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, now we'll carry on our readings um, from our chapter 27. And um, last week, we had said that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had met um, Ramananda Rai on the banks of the Godavari River in a, in a, in a town called Vidyanagar. Right. Lord Chaitanya's special treatment of Ramananda Rai indicated that although Ramananda Rai was born in a non brahmanical family, he was far, far advanced in spiritual knowledge and activity. Therefore, he was more respectable than one who simply happens to be born in a brahmanical family. So these statements are not meant to make those who are born in brahmanical families feel bad in any way. But it is to um, to make clear that if someone has the qualities of a Brahmin and they're not born in a Brahmanical family, they are still to be considered Brahmins. This is Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's message. And that even if someone is born in a Brahmin family, they still have a duty um, to cultivate the qualities of a Brahmin. It's not something that's automatic. And so um, they also basically need to become qualified in that sense. Otherwise, they, they cannot be accepted as a Brahmin. So everyone who occupies a position in society must occupy that position um, by, by having the qualities of that position. This is what we understand from this. And it makes sense, um, if we think about it from a spiritual perspective, that if somebody is taking the time and the effort to develop the qualities in order to, to please Krishna, then Krishna will be pleased with them. And if we just take it for granted that we have a, a birth um, claim to a position and we don't actually work for it, we don't practice it and we don't actually use it to try and please the Lord, then we can't expect that he would be, um, that we would earn special favor from him. So therefore, such a sincere devotee as Ramananda Rai, even if he was born in a, in a fourth class um, um, situation, taken to be a, a shudra. He was um, he was very beloved by Lord Chaitanya for his wonderful Brahmanical qualities and therefore accepted by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as a Brahman. Although Ramananda, out of his meek and gentle nature, considered himself to be born in a lower shudra family, Lord Chaitanya nonetheless considered him to be situated in the highest transcendental stage of devotion. Devotees never advertise themselves as great. But the Lord is very eager to advertise the glory of his devotees. This is a very important point. That although Ramananda Rai was so exalted, he could send it himself um, a fourth class person. He didn't behave like one, but he considered himself that. And these are the kinds of devotees that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that the Supreme Lord endeavors um, to praise, to glorify, um, and to um, to actually see being served in his place. After meeting for the first time that morning on the bank of the Godavari, Ramananda Rai and Lord Chaitanya separated with the understanding that Ramananda Rai would come in the evening to see the Lord. And so this is because um, the caste Brahmanas or the Brahmanas um, by birth who were present at the time, they couldn't appreciate the exchanges of love between the Lord and his pure devotee. They, they simply saw that Lord Chaitanya was um, a sannyasi from a, a very high class Brahmin family, and he was um, embracing and associating with, with what they thought of as a fourth class person. So, because of their offensive nature, Lord Chaitanya agreed to meet or arranged to meet Ramananda Rai a little later in the evening, where they would be able to have their confidential discussions without these um, personalities present. That evening, after the Lord had taken his bath and seated himself, Ramananda Rai came to see him with a servant. He offered his respects and sat down before the Lord. Before Ramananda Rai could even ask the Lord a question about the advancement of spiritual knowledge, the Lord said, please quote some verses from scripture about the ultimate goal of human life. And so the Lord went straight for um, the purpose of this discussion. Please quote some verses from scripture about the ultimate goal of human life. Sri Ramananda Rai at once replied, a person who is sincere in performing his occupational duty will gradually develop a sense of God consciousness. In this connection, he quoted a verse from the Vishnu Purana, which states that one worships the Supreme Lord by following the principles of one's occupational duty. 
and that there is no alternative for satisfying him. So this is very important because this is actually um, the position of of uh, Sanatana Dharma, or what we call Hinduism today. Many people have the understanding that performing one's duty is actually um, the highest goal in life, right? and one's duty, of course, they consider to be one's occupational duty. That is, um, one's duty um, in in a career sense, but also how that duty will serve um, one's family members, one's community, one's um, one's country and so on because a human being is born with so many debts to fulfill the purport is that human life is meant for understanding one's relationship with the supreme lord and acting in that relationship any human being can do this by dovetailing himself in the service of the lord while discharging his prescribed duties for this purpose human society is divided into four classes the intellectuals or brahmanas, the administrators, kshatriyas, the mer merchants, vaishyas, and the laborers or shudras. So we do agree that it's important that we, we perform our prescribed duty because Krishna actually instructs Arjuna quite extensively about this in, in Bhagavad Gita. But there's a way that one must perform those prescribed duties. Let's take an example. Krishna is telling Arjuna that he has a duty to act as a Kshatriya. But on the opposite side, there's his cousins, and they were also Kshatriyas. But how they carried out their duty was actually not desirable at all. Right? They were um, devious, they were cunning, they were merciless, right? they were greedy, they were envious, and we can go on. So as much as it's important that one fulfills one's duties in society, there's a way that one must fulfill those duties. This is very important. And the problem is that this is actually not taught in schools today along with duty. We, we teach children how to um, become um, administrators or how to become um, intellectuals or how to become um, merchants and we teach them crafts. But we don't teach them how to do this in a way that will be morally um, and um, and even spiritually, but at least morally um, correct. This is this is actually what's missing in society. So the Kauravas they also miss that point, and it led to their destruction in the end. So performing one's duty is it's not enough. It must be regulated. So how is it regulated? For each class, there are prescribed rules and regulations as well as occupational functions. The prescribed duties and qualities of the four classes are described in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 18, text 41 to 44. A civilized society should be organized so that the people follow the prescribed rules and regulations for their class. At the same time, for spiritual advancement, they should follow the four stages of ashram, namely student life, brahmacharya, household life, brihasta, Retired life, Vanaprastha, and renounced life of sannyas. So the way one becomes regulated or understands how to carry out one's duty in a in a in a moral um, in a in a way that is um, that is principled and, and will also lead to spiritual advancement is that one follows the system of ashrama, you know, these four um, stages of life: student life, householder life, Vanaprastha life, and sannyas alongside one's prescribed duties of being Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra. So what that means is that one spends at least um, one's youth in study, but not just study, which is sort of like what the educational system is right now, but one actually trains right, in moral and spiritual principles. Right? The way that the Vedic system um, was uh, was organized is that uh, the students would actually live with the, the spiritual master and they would also um, in that process learn how to live a regulated life they would be disciplined right? rising early controlling the senses um, studying scripture in in this env in this environment which actually brings the principles of scripture um, to life um, understanding the importance of of spiritual goals alongside um, one's material development. And um, and in that way, they could become not just um, um, functional members of society when they left, but the functions that they would carry out would also be good for society. 
because right now when we have um, the teaching of skills, right, whether that is in administration or whether that's in business and so on, um, they're not actually taught in a way that um, that they would be carried out in a model or principled way. It's almost like the the teaching is to get ahead or to be the best at the cost of everything else. And we can see how that, that leads to so much um, problems in society. So um, in the in the ashram of the teacher, uh, the students in the Vedic way of life, they would actually um, learn to be um, sense controlled. And if they went to um, to collect um, eatables for the day, right, they would bring that back to the ashram, but they wouldn't lay claim to it. They would offer it humbly to the teacher. And Sri Prabhupada says if the teacher did not call them for supper, they wouldn't go and demand that we brought this and you haven't um, you haven't prepared a supper for us. And this um, the importance of sense control is that. Um, one does not impose uh, one's sense desires on others, which is what happens in the world today, creating basically a culture of exploitation everywhere. So like this in so many ways, right, the, the student life was orientated so that um, those young people who went out into society were of the highest um, character morally and also spiritually, along with the development of skills for the for their particular class, whatever that class was. Um, Ramananda Rai stated that those who strictly follow the rules and regulations of these eight social divisions can actually satisfy the Supreme Lord, and one who does not follow them certainly spoils his human form of life and glides down towards hell. One can peacefully achieve the goal of human life simply by following the rules and regulations which apply to oneself. So we can consider the rules of each ashram um, and each varna, right, to be like the minimum standard of um, of spiritual development. Because if we attain to that, then it's a good platform, a solid, strong platform in which we can develop spiritual qualities and spiritual life. Right? If one attains to the level of goodness, then that is um, a platform for pure goodness, for transcendental life to begin and this is the importance so therefore following one's duty in in um, in the the according to the rules and regulations is actually very very important um, for all people the character of a particular person develops when he follows the regulative principles in accordance with his birth association and education so we see here that it's not just birth which is important for one to um, attain to a particular occupational duty it's also one's association and education. So association has a very um, uh, important bearing on the vocation that one may end up in, as well as, of course, one's education. So there is always allowances in the system of, of varnas, these four orders, right? Administra um, sorry, intellectualism, administration, um, trade, and, and craft. There is always um, an opportunity for someone who is born in, in a particular family in these orders to also change to one of the other um, occupations if they have the aptitude and the ability. So it's not forced on anyone, but that one follows um, the duties of that um, particular occupation according to the rules and regulations. And eventually we'll see in devotional service to the Lord, this is actually what's very important. The divisions of society are so designed that many people with different characteristics can be regulated under those divisions for the peaceful administration of society and for spiritual advancement as well. Because ultimately spiritual advancement is actually key in all of this. Um, the perfection actually begins with this, but it's not exactly enough, right? It needs to grow still. One who leads a regulated life centered around devotional service attains perfection. So this regulated occupational duty is there, but it must be centered around devotional service or perfection. Otherwise, such a regulated life is simply useless. So Lachitanya responds, after hearing Ramananda Rai expound upon the proper execution of a regulated life, Lord Chaitanya said that such a life is simply external. Indirectly, he asked Ramananda to describe something superior to such an external exhibition. So whereas we said it's so important for us to carry out our duties, if those duties are only carried out for the sake of carrying them out, for the sake of the body, then 
there is a little bit of a waste of time because everything that we build up to will just die with the body. If all our duties are only focused on the body or only about the body, providing for it, as well as, of course, the bodies of others, then it's all finished at the time of death. And that um, subconscious understanding that we have of this is sort of the reason why we try so very hard to prolong our lives, right? We all want in some way to achieve something. But even if we accept our mortality and we try to um, establish a legacy, for example, all of that will be finished in time. Eventually, all efforts that one makes for the body or makes in a material sense all come to an end. And this is a reality that we have to accept. And therefore, eventually, we can consider it um, a waste of time. Um, in order for us to be eternally benefited, we have to carry out these um, prescribed duties in a certain way, and that way is in devotion to the Lord. Formal execution of rituals and religion is useless unless aimed at attaining the perfection of devotional service. Lord Vishnu is not satisfied simply by a ritualistic adherence to Vedic instructions. He is actually pleased when one attains the stage of devotional service. So again, this is an understanding that most people have, that the Lord gave us the system of rituals, and that is what... Um, the Sanatana Dharma, as we know it now in Hinduism, is basically composed of. And of course, Lord Vishnu is invoked in all rituals as the ultimate benefactor. But it doesn't please him if we're only engaging in those rituals for material purposes. So why would it not please him? It's not that he's ungrateful. But he's pleased when we're freed of this material world and we come back to him. All the instructions that he gives us in spiritual life are for that end. He is most pleased when we are in his eternal association, um, living um, in bliss and knowledge and suffering in this material world. It's his love for us that motivates him to not be displeased with our engaging in all these rituals for temporary benefits right? and in the long run, bondage to this world. According to the verse cited by Ramananda Rai, one can rise to the point of devotional service by ritualistic performance. So that is, if we perform those rituals, the religious duties, the dharmas, the activities, the the careers we're in, all of those vocations, if we perform it all for the Lord, for Krishna, for Vishnu, for Narayan, without any expectation of reward, this is what becomes devotional service. So it doesn't mean that we have to give these things up, but we just have to utilize it in the correct way. In Bhagavad Gita, chapter 18, Texts 45 and 46. Sri Krishna, who appeared in order to deliver all classes of people, states, A human being can attain the highest perfectional stage of life by worshipping the Supreme Lord from whom everything has emanated through his occupational duties. This perfectional process was followed by great devotees like Hodayan, Tanka, Gramida, Guhadev, Kapardi, and Paruchi. All these great personalities followed this particular path of perfection, and so they engaged in their duties, and they did it all um, selflessly for the Lord, and this is how they attained the perfection of life, which is freedom from this world, which is liberation from all its miseries. The Vedic injunctions also aim in this direction, and this is what the Vedas is actually for. It may be giving us all these rituals, and it may seem to be for our benefit materially, but if we use that in service to the Lord and we free ourselves from this world, that's what the Vedas is actually there for. It's a way to get out of this world, not to remain here. Ramananda Rai wanted to present these facts before the Lord, but apparently mere discharge of ritualistic duties is not perfection. And so basically, he was presenting the facts, but in order for Lord Chaitanya to, to correct those facts. Therefore, Lord Chaitanya said that it was external, indicating that if a man has a material conception of life, he cannot attain the highest perfection, even if he follows all the ritualistic regulations. Right, so with all due respect to those people who, who follow these rituals, they know them well and they um, they know how to perform them or they know how to engage in them or when to engage in them in life. It's not enough. It's not going to help one get to the highest perfection. Um, so even though people may actually claim that the Bhagavad Gita is telling us to do this, to engage in these, um, in Dharma, and they, they classify Dharma in so many ways, they forget that at the end, 
Krishna says, Sarva Dharma Parityasha. You have to give up all these dharmas in the way that we understand it. Doing it for ourselves, doing it for our community, doing it for our families, doing it for for the sake of doing it. And for whatever other reason, we have to give that up and just surrender to him and surrender all of those results to him. This is the way that we can actually be free of suffering. Because to engage in these duties for ourselves or for anyone else in particular, it's not selfless when we do that, when we for example, just do it for our families because it's a sort of extended sense of gratification, Prabhupada says, right? where we're getting some pleasure from the fact that our family members are taken care of. So it's still ultimately for us and for our false ego. Um, the problem is not that Krishna, again, has a personal issue with this, but because anything that's done for us brings us karma. It means it binds us to this world. It signs us up for another lifetime, many more lifetimes, potentially. It keeps us cycling um, in birth and death. And Krishna wants us to stop all reactions. Shubha Ashubha, he says. He means no auspicious or inauspicious because even the auspicious results are bad for us because it binds us to this world. We've got to come back in order to fulfill those auspicious results. Krishna wants us with him, eternally happy and, and knowledgeable with him in his spiritual world. So he wants that we um, overcome all the reactions that come from um, engaging in these prescribed duties for ourselves or any other reason um, than him. And we dovetail everything towards his service for our own good in the end. So um, um, there's a very important verse in this regard in, in Srimad Bhagavatam, it's first canto, fifth chapter, text 17. It says, one who has forsaken his material occupations to engage in the devotional service of the Lord may sometimes fall down while in an immature stage. Yet there is no danger of his being successful. And in this regard, Sri Prabhupada gives the examples of Bharat Maharaj and King Chitra Ketu. And they were um, eventually they gave up their, their occupational duties. Both of them were kings, and both of them just left those positions in order to engage fully in devotional service. The problem was that for various reasons they fell from that. And Bharat Maharaj became attached to a deer, and King Chitraketu was cursed by Parvati Devi. So Bharat Maharaj became a deer in his next life, and King Chitraketu became a demon, Richasura. Uh, Richasur. So even though we may consider that it's quite a terrible thing to happen, both of them were fully aware of their previous devotional lives. Right? Versus if someone is engaged in occupational duties, then they die. They don't wake up in the next life and start again from where they left off in their previous life. If they were a rich banker and they perfected the banking profession, they were very well known, they were very accomplished in banking, they don't get reborn and then they, they just take up uh, in the banking profession again. So no matter how good we are in our occupational duty, we don't actually um, benefit it from it in our next life. In fact, we carry over the, the bad results of whatever we've done in our next life. That's a problem. But these two personalities, they not only remembered um, their past lives, they engaged in devotional service again to overcome um, the failings that they, they had, the temporary failings that they had. And then um, they were they perfected um, their lives. Bharat Maharaj, from a deer, he was born as Jad Bharat, and he, um, he he then was liberated. And um, if I remember correctly, Vichyasur also was liberated at the end of that life. So there is no loss for a devotee. A devotee who has started the process of devotional service will continue it in their next lives and beyond until they perfected it. The Lord doesn't let the devotee go, and in a very good sense. So there is eternal benefit versus if we're only engaged in our occupational duties and not doing them as service. So thank you all so much for your kind attention. Of course, these discussions are going to carry on in the next few chapters, so please um, stay with us. This is only the beginning of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's questions to Ramananda Rai and Ramananda Rai's wonderful answers. Shri Shintai Gorahari Ki Shri Ramananda Rai Ki Jai Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai Shri Shintai Gorahari are there any questions or comments or anything that I can help to clarify?
If not, um, we'll just discuss a couple of wonderful events that are coming up in the next week. Tomorrow is the disappearance day of um, Srila Madhavendra Puri. Madhavendra Puri is a very extraordinary personality and he is actually um, the spiritual master of Lord Chaitanya's spiritual master. Um, he um, appeared in our um, um, disciple, line of disciple succession, but he introduced um, love of God in a way that hadn't been um, described or uh, practiced before. Up to the point of Madhavendra Puri, love for Krishna, Narayan, Vishnu, this love was mainly or only in the in the rasas of servitorship, where you could just be a servant of God and um, neutrality, santaras, um, where one doesn't actually express um, very strong emotions for him. Sort of like how the cows are very, the trees are very placid. But Madhavendra Puri introduced um, that one could actually develop very deep emotions for the Lord. Um, and these can be expressed in, in friendship with him, in um, parenthood, and as well as in conjugal love. In particular, Madhavendra Puri um, was very much absorbed in the mood of the gopis. And this was um, something that he experienced throughout his pastimes. So it's described that he sowed the seeds of this love and Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu developed it or, or tended it into this, this great tree of, um, of love for Krishna and that, that expanded in so many different ways. It's actually quite extraordinary. So um, Madhavendra Puri, he, he actually, um, he traveled and preached quite um, extensively, but then eventually he spent most of his time in Vrindavan and, and Orissa. And Orissa is um, the province where um, Jagannath Puri is found. And um, while in Vrindavan, a very wonderful um, pastime happened. He was um, he was so absorbed um, in love for the Lord at Govardhan Hill that he went to a kund called Govinda Kund and um, and then a cowherd boy approached him. And this cowherd boy uh, brought him a pot of milk. And um, and just on seeing this, this beautiful child, he actually forgot all his hunger and thirst. And he asked him who he was. Um, and of course, um, this child just gave him a, a very simple answer. I'm a cowherd boy. I'm in this village. Nobody fasts here, so you must you must actually you must drink the smoke, and um, and people have seen you, so I they sent me here to to give you the milk. and then and then he left, and um, and Madhavendra Puri, um, he was just amazed, and he had a dream that night where he actually saw this the same child, and of course it was Krishna. <laughs> And um, and Krishna led him to a place in the in the jungle right, around Govardhan Hill. Govardhan Hill, we, we don't see um, much jungles there now. That's because of um, so much developments happening. But at the time, it was extremely forested. And uh, and Madhavendra and the, the the child Gopal, he showed Madhavendra Puri that he's actually in this forest. That he's he's been living here and he's suffering from cold rain and heat and um, and he wants to be rescued. So this of course um, is a deity of Gopal. Um, the Gopal deity had been hidden in the forest and um, he wanted to be found by his devotee Madhavendra Puri. Um, so Madhavendra Puri went the next day with the help of many villagers and they found Gopal and they, um, they had a very wonderful installation ceremony and initially, Gopal stayed in um, in Vrindavan, but he moved um, for safety reasons to uh, the city of Nathwar, and he's now known as Sri Nathji, very, very famous, beautiful deity. So the, another pastime that was connected to um, the Gopal deity is that once um, Madhavendra Puri wanted to, to get Chandan for him. The Lord very much likes Chandan, 
it's a it's a paste that uh, has a cooling effect on the body. We know that India has um, very hot summers. So Madhavendra Puri went to get um, Chandan for Gopal. And on the way there, um, he he actually um, he passed the temple of uh, Akshir Chor Gopinath. Um, he um, he uh, this this deity of go actually the deity of Gopinath he wasn't known as Akshir Chor at at the time. He he got the name after this pastime. So um, Madhavendra Puri was watching the worship of Gopinath, thinking about his Gopal, thinking about um, the preparations that he could make for Gopal. Um, and when the kheer, the, the, the kheer offered to Gopinath is of very wonderful quality, he thought that he if he had this kheer, it would be, if he could taste it, he would know how to prepare it. But then he thought he had, that was a very offensive thought because the kheer hadn't been offered to Gopinath yet. So he felt like he had, he had actually contaminated it just by his thoughts. So this was a high level of service um, that they had. He wouldn't, he wouldn't even think of tasting something before the Lord. So he considered himself an offender and he left that temple and um and then he he actually went he went away um, to atone for his thoughts so gopinath however after his offering was done he came in the dream of the pujari and told him that uh, he had put aside one pot of kheer there was one pot less that the pujari took out after the offering gopinath had taken that pot and kept it for madhavendra puri to taste um, so he told the Pujari, please go and find him and give him this pot. So therefore he got the name Kshir Chor, um, the, the stealer of um, Kheer. He stole it for his devotee, Madhavendra Puri. So the Pujari was amazed at this. He he went to find this very fortunate person. He, he looked quite far and wide and told Madhavendra Puri that the Lord has actually, um, he's actually hid this for you. It's meant for you. Um, so, um, Madhavendra Puri was, um, he considered himself very fortunate. Um, and he, he honored this, um, this prasadam. And um, when he eventually got all that chandan for, for Gopal and he was on his way back, um, Gopal came in a dream and told him that actually you should offer this um, this chandan to Gopinath, and I will also feel um, the, the cooling effects of that. So um, there are many other wonderful pastimes. Madhavendra Puri um, eventually um, he passed he passed from this world, but before he passed, his wonderful disciple Ishwara Puri served him so much in in those day, in those days with so much of love. He was actually cleaning up after him, um, and and rendering so much a wonderful service that Madhavendra Puri blessed Ishwara Puri. And this is how Ishwara Puri got the opportunity to actually be the spiritual master of Lord Chaitanya. So tomorrow is the disappearance day of Madhavendra Puri and we pray very much for his mercy um, and blessings in devotional service. And of course, um, this Monday is, um, is the appearance day of Lord Chaitanya. So in particular, we can pray Madhavendra Puri, that we can increase our love and appreciation for Lord Chaitanya. Um, for, in order to glorify Lord Chaitanya, we'll just we'll read this very nice bhajan. Actually, um, it's it's uh, written by Sarvabhama Bhattacharya. So I thought it was very nice because we've been discussing um, the discussions between Sarvabhama Bhattacharya and Lord Chaitanya for a while. And um, many of the wonderful verses that Sarvabhama Vasacharya uh, wrote in appreciation for Lord Chaitanya, they haven't been preserved, but but these have. And um, and we can try and um, deepen our mood of appreciation for Lord Chaitanya through his words. Um, and I hope that you all will be attending programs on Monday in glorification of, of Lord Chaitanya and, um, and spending the day in meditation on him, his pastimes and his instructions and um, deepening, deepening our commitment to spreading the holy names as he would have wanted. So we'll just read this because I actually don't know the tune for it. Malaya Savasita Bhushita Gatram 
मूर्ति मनहार विश्व पवित्र पदनाख रजित लजित चंद्रे शुद्धा कनक जय गौर नमस्ते स्वागत्र पुलका लोचना पूर्ण दिव जीव दया माया तप विधीर्ण संख्य जलपति नाम सहस्रे सुधा कनक जय गौर नमस्ते उंगजना गर्जन रंजे लोचना कलियुग पाप ससंघे पादरज तथित दुष्ट समस्ते सुधा कनक जय गौर नमस्ते सिंहागमन जितीतांडव लीला दीन दय मय तरणशीला अज भाव पादनाखचंद्रे सुधा कनक जय गौर नमस्ते गौरांगवृत मलती मले मेरो विलंबित गंगधारे मंद मधुर हस भास मुखचंद्रे सुध कनक जय गौर नमस्ते पौगु विराजित चंदन भला कुंकुम रचित देह विशल उमापति सेवित पद नाख चंद्रे सुध कनक जय गौर नमस्ते भक्ति परधीन सत कवेश कमना सुनर्थक भोग विशेष मल विराजित देह समस्ते सुध कनक जय गौर नमस्ते भोग विरक्ति संयसी वेश सिख मोचन लोक प्रवेश भक्ति विरक्ति प्रवर्तक चित्त सुध कनक जय गौर नमस्ते Finely dressed and limbs decorated with sandalwood, your enchanting form purifies the universe, and your radiant toenails shame the moon. Jaya Gora, pure and golden, obeisance is unto you. Your hair bristles, and your eyes are wet with ah uh, with tears and saving the souls. You become very merciful, following your example. You chant thousands of names. Jaya Gora, pure and golden, obeisance is unto you. With the roars of pleasure, you tremble the rays that storm. You give fear to sinners in Kali Yuga. The dust of your lotus feet strikes all guilty persons. Jaya Gora, pure and golden, obeisances unto you. Your pastimes of having the lion subjugating to your dance and helping the fallen souls. Your lila has immersed Brahma and Shiva. They adore your moon-like toenails. Jaya Gora, pure and golden, obeisances unto you. Gora covers a bad. Malasi flower, like the mountain Meru covering the Ganges, his moon-like face smiles between verses. Jaya Gora, pure and golden, obeisances unto you. With red sandalwood paste, his front side shines. With saffron clothing, his body becomes resplendent. His toenails are each like the moon, which serve his devotee, Lord Shiva. Jaya Gora, pure and golden, obeisances unto you. Peace takes form once one surrenders to devotion. Lord Gora dances in beautiful movements and covers his body with beautiful garlands. Jaya Gora, pure and golden, obeisances unto you. He renounced all pleasures in his sannyas form. To the people, his head appears to be shaven. He is impulsed by intense desire and bhakti. Jaya Gora, pure and golden, obeisances unto you. So this translation, I think sometimes if it's um, a little literal, it may be. Um, difficult to understand, but um, it's quite unusual, and I thought it was a nice, mostly a nice description um, of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Kaisal Bhama Bhattacharya. So thank you again. Um, we pray for the mercy of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his dear devotees like Madhavendra Puri and Ramananda Rai and all of you. Um, I hope you have a wonderful Gopurnima, and um, we'll announce again our next class because. Um, we might not meet next week because of services for Durban Rati Yatra, um, which I hope um, we'll meet all of you at. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Thank you all, everyone. Hare Krishna. Thank Hare you, Krishna. Thank you, Hare dear Krishna. Mataji. Dandava Pranam to all. Happy Gaurav Purnima.